for anatomy from the UNISP agency, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Francois uh, Forger. Uh, mes excuses si, si je pas prononcé ton nom correctement. Uh, he's going to give uh, his lecture in French because he's a French guy. No. This is from, from my request, for sure, no. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, we're going to get uh, so many information about uh, the Mars mission and hopefully you, all, all of us are going to benefit from it because I know that some of you are doing research uh, in Mars. Uh, I myself, I, uh, I, do, I did some Martian atmosphere simulations uh, with some of the students and would like to know more about uh, this uh, mission and about the data and how, and how also we can benefit from it because we would like to be part of the whole story. I recall uh, recall uh, maybe 2016-17 when meeting with uh, Sarah Amiri uh, at MBRC to talk about uh, how to gather data, how to reduce and so on. It has been a long time. So it would be good to learn more about it and uh, I would like to invite right away uh, Dr. Francois to give his talk, please. Shokran, thank you very much. So, um, to uh, Hor, who is there, will tell you all the details about the uh, Emirates Mars mission, Amal. But uh, before that, I will introduce you about this uh, subject, the climate of planet Mars, which is in fact the objective, the scientific objective of the, the Mars mission. But uh, I will use a, 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 I'm sure you're already somewhat familiar with Mars. But, so I will add a lot of details about something which is not exactly um, the, the present day climate, like it is observed by the Mars mission, but also I will talk about the climates, in other words, the past climate of planet Mars. I will explain to you that Mars has shown very different uh, visage and you, you, you will be able to, to see that. So it's an introduction. I will not mention too much about the Mars mission and then who will give you all the details. So this is a picture from, <laughs> from Hope, the first picture, a nice picture we obtained. And this is just to tell, remind you that Mars is a, is a small planet, very active, very beautiful. But of course, uh, it has a thin CO2 atmosphere. And on this basis, you could say, well, it is very different from the Earth. But compared to the Earth, it's not that different. Of, uh, of course, it's half the size of the, of the Earth. It has, a, as I said, a thinner atmosphere, but there are really a lot of similarities, is in particular related to climate and meteorology. For instance, as you may know, the length of the solar day is 24 hours and 40 minutes, very comparable to what we have on Earth. Also, the obliquity, the inclination of the axis of rotation compared to the orbit plan is 25.2 degrees, and it's very close to what we have on the Earth. That means that the, uh, the seasonal cycle, the definition of polar night, the edge of polar night, the polar cycle, the tropics, everything is almost the same. So there are lots of similarities. And in practice, notably because of the rotation rate, we have the same kind of, uh, of uh, meteorological uh, structure, like uh, uh, in the mid latitude, you have uh, westerlies and low pressure, high pressure system. In the tropics, you have uh, trade winds and monsoon jet. You have lots of similarities. Of course, if you go on the surface, uh, it looks like a desert on the Earth, of course. The temperature in the afternoon reached at the surface 20 degrees Celsius. But of course, the following night is super continental, super desertic climate. The following night, it goes to minus 80 degrees, typically in the tropics. At the latitude of uh, Dubai, it's minus 80. And another difference, except that there is no camel at all, is that the, the sky is never blue. It is always... Uh, Orange like that. And the reason is that uh, permanently in the atmosphere, some dust which is lifted. For instance, here you see a dust storm lifted by a low pressure system. And you can see all the complexity of the climate system nowadays. Not only you have dust always putting uh, uh, aerosol in the atmosphere, but also you have this ice. It's not water ice. This, what we see here is CO2 carbon dioxide ice. Uh, which is actually a at, uh, uh, frozen atmosphere. The atmosphere is made on 90% CO2. So you can reach one meter thick uh, every season. And then you can see a little bit of haze. And this time, this is water ice. Uh, in fact, you have a water cycle on Mars. It's really coming from this thing on the right. This is uh, the North Polar layer deposits, North Polar cap, if you want. So big glaciers, two kilometers thick, and it's about 1,000 kilometers across, and you can see the scale. And this big glacier is a, 
is heated by the sun during in summertime at around summer solstice. You can see it here. And it provides a lot of water vapor into the atmosphere. Transport, this water vapor can condense and form clouds, as you can see here. It can condense onto the surface to do frost, seasonal frost, only during winter, sometime only during the night. But overall, the point I'm going to reach is the fact that if you clean the, the pictures from the clouds and the seasonal frost, Mars is really desertic, super dry. It looks like that. So there is no permanent ice outside the polar regions. There is no liquid water. So Mars is nowadays real, real desert. But it's not, it, the, the point, my point today quickly is to say that it is not as always been the case. Indeed, if you look at the geology this time, you discover that in many locations, you have remnants of glaciers. You can see here moraines in such a desert is surprising. This is in mid latitude in the south. In the north, you have a complete areas where you have a beautiful, uh, what we call rock glaciers. You don't have water ice at the surface. It's, the ice is covered by rocks, but you still have the glaciers there. And even in the tropics, uh, you can see um, traces of uh, rock glaciers that have been covered. They're not stable anymore, but they've been buried. And they are there. So just as if you had big glaciers in the mountains uh, near Dubai, that will be surprising. You'll say, wow, the climate must have been different in the past. In fact, in this particular area, you can, there have been some maps by the geologists. The orange region had been mysterious for some time. And uh, in 2003, people understood that these are made by glaciers, erosion, moraines, laminate of ice. So it was very impressive. This is, you can see the middle of the, the image is the equator. So what is going on? Oh, I forgot one more point, is that starting at 50 degrees latitude, it was discovered that, okay, you, if you look at the surface, you only see sand, but it seems that below the, a few centimeters of sand, you have ice. This was discovered by nuclear physics. <laughs> Indeed, you have a neutron spectrometer on a paycraft named Mars Odyssey, and the physics is the following. The, because the atmosphere is thin, the surface is bombarded by gamma ray coming from the sun mostly or from the, the galaxy. And this gamma ray uh, does nuclear reaction and trigger the, the nucleus of uh, atoms. And you have a, a flow of neutrons that are dislodged and emitted and that go out to space. And you can measure them from space. If the, the ground is dry, you have lots of neutrons coming. If, the, if you have ice, even hidden ice in the subsurface, then the neutrons that are emitted, the blue, are slow because when they collide with the neutrons, which are the, 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 uh, the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, they are slowed and you have less neutrons. They could map the flux of neutrons and they found this. And if I won't have time to describe, this is a map of Mars. And the conclusion was that wherever it's blue, you, have, you must have sands and below that ice. It was difficult to believe because from the, surf, from the space, you only see sand. So in fact, because of this, they decided to send a spacecraft to check that. This was the Phoenix probe, it sent uh, more than 10 years ago. And um, it, was, uh, it was sent to one of these areas where it was supposed to, where you're supposed to have a lot of ice, but you cannot see ice. So the Phoenix probe arrived on, uh, on May 26, 2008, and it was big suspense. Are we going to find ice? So the first ground view of the Mars Polar Region was you know, expected a lot and no surprise, it was typically polar with the, well, that's the joke from the PI. That's a polar bear, okay, you're not familiar with it. Uh, nevertheless, it was typically polar indeed because did you see the ground has a specific texture. This is called polygonal terrain and this is on the earth. It corresponds exactly to what we find in the polar regions, for instance. This is a, what we call a rock glacier in Antarctica and you can see this uh, polygonal structure and they're almost the same in Mars. Moreover, very quickly, when the camera looked be between the legs of the lander, one could see that the retro rocket, the rocket has dislodged the sand and below pure ice. Yet there were a shovel and the shovel could remove the sand, pure ice. So, wow, what happened? It must mean that sometime in the past, Mars was like that. This is a paper in nature. It was even, even if in fact before this, uh, this mission. And it seems that Mars recently, a few, maybe hundreds of thousands years ago, was covered with water ice like that. So what happened? Well, 
One theory is that, of course, it might be due to the climate change recent, might be due to the variation of the orbit and especially of the obliquity. This is the obliquity of Mars that has been reconstructed by an astronom astrophysicist. And you can see on the right, it's present zero. And if you go into the past, you can see strong variation by tens of degrees. Five million years ago, it reached more than 45 degrees obliquity. If you compare that with the Earth, the Earth is just varying, obliquity is just varying between plus or minus 1.4 degrees. It's not much. Nevertheless, this small variation has been suspected to be the reason, the origin of the ice ages on Mars, 15,000 years ago, uh, Mars, on the Earth. 15,000 years ago, you know that a large part of the northern hemisphere was covered with the uh, ice sheet, like we know have in Greenland, but it was also true in Russia, in Scandinavia, in Canada. So very different climate. So of course, with such variation of the obliquity, we could suspect that there were ice ages on Mars. Well, to better understand that, my team is, model, is doing what we call climate modeling. We have 3D models and they simulate the climate minutes by minute. I won't have time to detail that. Of course, this is a very specific application, understanding the past climate on Mars. Our main job is to understand present day Mars and we work on the EMI response mission. That's why I'm here today. Nevertheless, you can see, you can simulate minute by minute what happened to Mars. If you say, okay, if I put water ice at the top, but I increase at the pole and I increase the obliquity, what happened? We did this experiment, so thought experiment in the model. And we find that not surprisingly during summer, the temperature at the pole, because the insulation is much higher. If you have at high obliquity, you put a lot of vapor, vapor in the system. And after a beyond uh, an obliquity of 40 degrees, typically, we found that uh, the, the heating is such in the polar regions that water vapor, the ice at the pole is not stable anymore. It tends to accumulate and it does not accumulate everywhere. It accumulates in very specific regions, for instance, on the east side of the volcano. This is a, a, a accumulation rate millimeters per year observed on the side of the volcanoes. And you can compare this, pretty, this map completely independent from the observation compared to the map of the glaciers that has been mapped by geologists about the same time, that's some years ago, and we were very excited when we discovered that. So it seems that we understand a few things. So I won't have time to detail that, but starting to understand that indeed, there have been some period where you have as ages. I will skip that. It was fun, but. <laughs> and we can continue, imagine, okay, the, if you go to high obliquity, the ice is not stable anymore. You, you create glaciers there. Now, if you go back to higher obliquity, what happened to lower obliquity like today? Well, the ice is not stable anymore, but it doesn't go back to the, the pole right away. It creates ice sheet. And suddenly you say, hmm, maybe this looks like the mass that we have been discovered by uh, nuclear physics. So uh, that's the point. Another things that are of interest is what happened when Mars goes to low obliquity, 15 degrees in the recent past, but we know statistically, before that is difficult to go into the past, but we know that maybe 30 million years ago or even before, the obliquity went to even lower values. So values like five degrees, maybe two degrees. So the, the orbit of Mars was really, you know, rotating like that, that means, if you increase the obliquity, that means that throughout the year, the insulation at the pole is always very low. The sun remains very low at the horizons and you don't receive much energy. The pole became much colder than they are today on average. And with our model, we can show that in that case, it's not only water ice that is trapped there, but actually the CO2 atmosphere can be frozen there permanently, not only during the season, and actually collapse into the polar regions. When we do the calculation, we even find that they won't go collapse exactly at the pole. Where they will tend to accumulate is on the polarward slopes in craters and in, on mountains at high latitude, because they are in the shade. You see, imagine you are a, a, a slope uh, toward the, the pole, you'll never have much sun. It's really cold and CO2 condensed there. What has been interesting is that we have realized by checking some craters in that this high latitude that there were uh, very, very weird uh, geological uh, landform, like moraines, but very nothing like the Earth. And we believe that these moraines have been deposited by CO2 ice glaciers based on, the, you know, when, when the atmosphere was collapsed. 
And the CO2 ice is very fluid, not very viscous. And it puts, it creates moraines like that. We, we think we understand. The, so these are remnants of a time when the, the planet was different. Almost no atmosphere, no dust, no water. Uh, CO2 was completely condensed. You only had left uh, argon and nitrogen up to 25 Pascal. On the surface, the, the sky must have been dark all the time. You could see the star. Uh, so it was a completely different planet. Okay, I have a few minutes left because I told you about ice on the other pole, but on present day Mars, it's even worse with regard to liquid water. As you all know, there is no <laughs> liquid water never on Mars. We understand why the pressure is too low. So uh, if any liquid water will evaporate and cannot be stable, you need a higher pressure. The temperature can go beyond zero degrees Celsius, but it, the, if you put ice in the morning, it will sublime really quickly well before you can uh, melt it. So there is no wicked water today. I put these <laughs> slides because of course, it's a disappointment on the earth, as you all know, uh, life as we can understand it, as we can imagine it needs uh, liquid water. And in fact, wherever you have liquid water on the earth, you have life. So we tend to do the equation, liquid water is equal life. There is no liquid water on Mars, it's disappointing. However, as you know, must have been different in the past. And now I'm talking about much other uh, terrains, much other time. You must have seen that before. This is Mars topography uh, that has been uh, mapped by a, a MOLA instrument on Mars Global Surveyor. And this topography, uh, so in blue is the low lying plains, red the high plateau. What you can see is that in the blue plains, there is almost no crater, but on the islands, it's full of craters. The reason is because these islands are very old compared to whatever we can find on the earth. We estimate that they are 3.5, 4 billion years old. And what's interesting, if you go to these terrains with love craters that are 3.5, 4 billion years old, as you all know, and I will quick on that because this is super well known, you find uh, remnants of rivers, of lakes. If you look at the mineralogy, you can detect clays and, um, and uh, maybe sometime uh, sulfates that are remnants of uh, lakes and stuff like that. So you have many reasons to think that 3.5, 4 billion years ago, Mars must have been like that. At, at this time, of course, it's exciting because life started on the Earth. So it's, that's why, of course, we dream of exploring Mars. We could send the astronauts, not yet, maybe one of you someday. Uh, you see these guys excited because with this little uh, um, their microscope is, uh, I think, discovering a fossil, fossil of, of life. But of course, we can't do that yet, super expensive. Meanwhile, we've been sending robots and uh, like Curiosity that has been uh, exploring what we think is uh, ancient lakes and really characterizing the different sediments and try to understand. Now we have Perseverance that is in other lakes and uh, even better than Curiosity will prepare samples that will be bring back to Earth in uh, 10 years from now. Uh, next year, we're going to launch in Europe uh, this rover, the Rosin Franklin rover. Uh, so it will launch in September 2022. It's, uh, it's uh, June, it will land in June 10, 23 at 7.32. I gave a talk in Armenia, so that's why I put that. Forgot to change it to Dubai time. I think there is uh, one more hour, but it might be 8.32 in Dubai. Nevertheless, it's almost my last slide. My message just to say, okay, I'm sure you all knew that there were liquid water, but my point as a climate, Mars climatologist is to say that the early mass climate that has been uh, suitable for liquid water and lakes remains a mystery to us. We, we have realized that uh, we used to think that, okay, in the past, maybe the atmosphere was thicker than today. Maybe you have one bar of CO2. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It probably must have been warm enough and so on, but we've been modeling that and it doesn't work. It remains cold. So we've been trying a lot of things. Uh, the impact of impacts, the, uh, the special greenhouse effect of CO2 ice clouds that are created in that conditions. Uh, the effect of, uh, of, uh, the effect of uh, volcanoes. Right now, for instance, the, the, on the theory which is unfashioned to explain how you could have liquid water lakes and river on Mars is to imagine that you saturate the atmosphere with hydrogen. And it turns out we think that the combination of CO2 and hydrogen is a good greenhouse gas, good greenhouse atmosphere, could explain the lakes and river, but it's still a mystery, really. So not only we have to study, understand what happened, did life started, but in some way I'm interested in curiosity and perseverance because they are also telling us 
uh, stuff about what happened with regard to the climate. And it's a big mystery. Okay. So my conclusion is the planet Mars has known many faces through time. Uh, again, uh, a long time ago, you had rivers, like maybe oceans. Sometime in the past at very low obliquity, it was completely like the moon almost on thin atmosphere, nothing going on. At high obliquity, it must have been, you know, full of ice, ice ages, lots of clouds. In our model, we have, it's completely saturated with clouds. And then we are back to the present day uh, Mars, which is one planet Mars among many possibilities. In the future, we'll go back to ice ages and to moon-like Mars. But right now we have the present day Mars uh, planet to understand. It's in the middle of two extremes. And uh, that's why we are uh, using these. Uh, right now, we are excited by the uh, Emirates Mars mission, Alamal Hope, uh, that is really teaching us about the present day climate system. And of course, on the past climate system, because it's the same climate system that has been varying with the obliquity. Thank you. In fact, it's the it's it's a subtle physics, but uh, it's the it's it's triggered by the uh, subtle influence of Jupiter and so on and so on. When I, I was saying, in fact, because the real mystery is not the fact that the obliquity of Mars is changing like that. It, the, the, not the mystery, but the, something which was not obvious is that the Earth could be the same. And the reason why 1.4 degrees, and the reason why the Earth is stabilized, we believe is because of the moon. If, without the moon, the rotation rate will be different and so on, and it will be in the similar regime than Mars, with var the obliquity varying considerably and enormous climate change. What would have, if, if it had been the case, would life on the earth would have been similar or not killed or that will have been uh, triggered more evolution we don't know but uh, it's it, it's a specificity of the earth more than the specificity of mars so you mean that we still believe uh do you think it's two billion years I don't think so, because the, when I'm saying the moon has this impact, the reason is because the moon slowed the rotation of the Earth. That's this impact. So no, it is slowed. Even if the moon goes, the obliquity won't change anymore. And in fact, before that, in one billion years from now, we will be transformed not into Mars, but into Venus. That's another story. <laughs> Thank you very much. How do you differentiate between CO2 and CO2? Oh, uh, we have in practice on present day Mars, there are typically we have uh, with the eye, you cannot see the difference. So there are typically two ways in the observations. One is to when you use thermal infrared spectrometer, so we measure the temperature, and, uh, and the CO2 eyes is always exactly at the frost point because it's in contact with the atmosphere. So it's always exactly at, for instance, at a given pressure, it will be 148K, exactly like if you were uh, measuring the temperature of an iceberg, you will see it's all, always zero or minus two at the, at the edge. The other way is the near infrared, then you do spectroscopy, and there you can see clearly uh, some very well-known lines of CO2 ice, which are not the same that the lines of water. So in the spectroscopy with instruments like Omega, on Mars Express or CRISM on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, you will recognize the instantaneously. No, if you only have a camera like uh, we have on the Emirates Smart Mission, you cannot distinguish. Fortunately, we have a thermal infrared spectrometer and then you can map the, what the, 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 the CO2 ice cap. Thank you very much, Dr. Francois. So, uh, uh, thank you again for this nice presentation. So, thank you very much. To give us a lecture about the Mars Emirates Mars mission data, please. Can everyone hear me? Uh, thank you, Francois, for that very exciting introduction to the mission um, and makes it makes us all very excited to look at what the Mars mission is seeing um, or the Hope Probe is seeing right now and 
what we can infer about what happened in the past. Um, so I'll briefly go over the science objectives of the Mars mission. Um, so why the, the objectives that we hope to achieve um, directly through the mission. And then of course, there are a lot of other things that scientists can research on their own. We're hoping that people can access that data. So another thing that I'll be addressing here is how to access the data, um, what it looks like, um, how you can use it. Um, so uh, starting with um, EMM in a glance, uh, so the Hope Probe was launched in July 2020, 2022. Um, it reached Mars orbit insertion in February uh, 2021, earlier this year. And um, it moved, it transitioned into its science orbit uh, in Mars, uh, March uh, 29, 2021. Uh, and then we started our science uh, mission uh, where we transitioned into our science phase. Uh, May and May 20, 23rd uh, this year. And then um, the, the Mars, uh, the EMM um, science mission will last for an entire year, which is two Earth years, an entire Martian year, which is two Earth years. Um, and then there's a possibility for an extended mission uh, for an additional Martian year. Um, and the first uh, EMM data release was uh, October 1st. Um, so early last month, um, which is, and I'm trying, I'm going to be giving you an update on how you can access it, even if you might have heard of what the objectives are um, before. So uh, a brief on the EMM science objectives. Um, so we have three main objectives. Uh, the first is to characterize the state of the margin lower atmosphere on global scales and its geographic diurnal and seasonal variability. Um, and then objective B is related to correlating the rates of thermal and photochemical atmospheric escape with, escape with conditions in the collisional or margin atmosphere. And the final objective is to characterize the spatial structure uh, and variability of key constituents of the margin atmosphere. So this uh, graphic shows you um, the different layers of the atmosphere that we're going to be looking at through EMM. Um, and you can see the different constituents um, basically at the, different at the different layers. So lower in the atmosphere, we will be looking at uh, clouds and we'll be looking at dust, we'll be looking at water. Um, and then uh, we'll also be looking at the temperature um, and the th uh, higher up, we'll be looking at oxygen, uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Um, and we'll, the final objective, uh, the, th the second objective is to connect all of the, all of those uh, layers of the atmosphere to get a better picture of how the climate of Mars um, works. So we have three instruments um, uh, on the HOPE probe. Um, we have the EMIRS, uh, which is the uh, Emirates Mars Infrared Spectrometer. And we have the uh, uh, EXI, which is the Emirates Exploration Imager, and EMUS, which is the Emirates Mars Ultraviolet Spectrometer. As mentioned by Francois earlier, we have the imager and we also have spectrometers that are going to be telling us, uh, giving us like the spectral uh, uh, ranges of what we're looking at. Um, so the EMIRS um, instrument will be looking at um, absolute radiance of CO2 um, absorption band, uh, as mentioned earlier. And then from that, we can infer the temperature profile uh, of, uh, the, the, of the atmosphere of Mars from zero to 50 kilometers. And we'll also be looking at absolute radiance over a, a subset of spectral range where we can see the surface temperature um, and we can look at relative radiance of dust uh, uh, absorption band where we can see the dust optical depth and the relative radiance of uh, water ice absorption bands where we can see the ice optical depth. And finally, uh, EMIRS will show us uh, the relative radiance of uh, water vapor absorption bands where we can infer through that the water vapor column abundance. And then EXI will give us uh, 2D images uh, at, uh, at this radiance um, to see ice. And then we'll also be able to see ozone column abundance. And finally, we'll get a color image of Mars. So you can see uh, how each instrument part corresponds to um, different parts of the atmosphere. So earlier, um, EMIRS uh, is focused more on the lower atmosphere and EXI is also mostly on the lower atmosphere. And then we have EMUS, which is looking more towards the thermosphere and the exosphere where we're looking at light intensity 
uh, an altitude profiles uh, of H, um, the H um, wavelengths, the hydrogen wavelengths, uh, which will give us uh, information about the density of the hydrogen corona and uh, up in the exosphere. And then we'll also look at the light intensity of uh, the oxygen profile, where we can get information about the oxygen corona and the relative column density of oxygen, and finally the relative uh, column density of uh, CO2 uh, in the thermosphere. Um, so these are examples of uh, images that the um, or the of, of data from the three instruments. Um, so you can see the EXI images at the top at the different. Um, yeah, so you can see the RGB images uh, at the far right uh, for EXI, and then you can see the um, temperature uh, uh, data of EMIRS at the bottom left and the EMUS um, oxygen uh, intensity in the bottom right. So these are examples of uh, the data that we get from Mars and from the different instruments, uh, from EMM and from the different instruments. Um, so what makes EMM unique uh, compared to other missions is it's um, EMM has the combination of uh, global geographic and local time coverage on diurnal and subseasonal time scales to allow detailed assessment of atmospheric circulation and transport. So basically it gives us uh, from its orbit, uh, we're able to look at uh, different local times that uh, and dif uh, different seasons, more seasons coverage uh, that other missions have given us which can give us more information about what's going on with the planet over a diurnal cycle. Um, so more information on how you can get the data is seen here, you can see QR code. Um, so the Science Data Center for the Emirates Mars mission is linked there. Um, it was created to be able to give scientists uh, globally access to the data um, and it's openly accessible to anyone who wants, who's interested in looking at the data. Um, in order to access this data, you have to create an account on the website. So you need an email um, and you'll be able to access it. And that's only to be able to send you links uh, to download large um, files and to ensure that the data isn't constantly being uh, queried by non-users. Uh, so the website currently has documentation um, of the data where you can learn more about what you're looking at and what, how you can use the data. And then software for retrieving the data. Uh, and there's a data avail availability page uh, and you can see quick looks of the data. So there's an example of that over there for EXI where you can quickly see what the data is. Um, and then um, there's a data search and download page on there. So this is an example of the file naming convention. Um, so it's, it looks a bit complicated, but uh, you have three instruments. So the file name is going to tell you what instrument you're looking at, if it's EMIRS, EXI, or EMUS. And there's also the data processing level um, of the file that you're looking at. So we have, I think, level one, level two, and possibly level three uh, data that's going to be available later, but we currently have level one, level two data uh, available. Um, and then we have uh, the date and time uh, at the start of the observation and the orbit number of the observation and the observation mode. Um, so how the, the instrument looks at the planet, uh, like what, what mode the instrument was in when it took the data um, and um, the geometry of the re reconstruct. Uh, so the geomet geometry of the uh, file and a descriptor uh, of the file and then, yeah, the number of the revision. So there's a new version of the um, data file. And that's an example of uh, a file name and what it might look like. Um, but there's more information on the website um, about all of that. So it'll be easy for you to look it up um, when you're looking at the data. Um, finally, this is a QR code of the website if you want to take a look at it really quick. Um, and if you have any questions, this is my life. last slide. So you have, uh, so what do you mean? I mean, uh, I 
I think it, it depends on in in such for such spacecraft data we have a different level of data so typically the level two data will be nicely calibrated uh, spectra for instance for uh, the emirs and uh, and for the in the uv for the uv spectrometer but uh, of course it is possible that there will be revision so if you go to level zero you will have a raw number from the dsn level one you will have a not too well calibrated things and then level two is the calibrated thing it, it's not because it's fully calibrated that it's not it cannot be revised at some point and level three is when you extract information for instance we uh, from this thermal infrared uh, profile we extract temperature profile that's a level three product but that's very often to do science you go directly to level three data and this would be the available for us or that you have to do the the level two data are part of the release yeah. and level three is planned to be released uh, it's not in the first package because it it's not easy to really have a final version of the inversion scheme to go from spectra to temper for instance temperature profile but it's planned to be on on the website as well so this is public anyone can do yes yeah that's the spirit of this meeting Great this mission sorry Great Absolutely, and it has been uh, it has been uh, the will of this uh, project uh, since the beginning. The uh, MBRSC and UAE has been willing to have a kind of a public uh, public uh, science available. Uh, so they're currently working on it. I don't think there's a release date. Um, to be honest, this morning I, I saw a plot where it was written, <laughs> but I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> it depends on for which data set you're talking about, yeah. but uh, I'm more familiar with the thermo infrared data set, and uh, I think it is supposed to be uh, like in a few months from now. That's the not not one year, a few months from now, especially for the the the, the all the data that were obtained uh, since uh, April all the way to this summer. Then there is a break, uh, and uh, for some reasons, including the fact that Mars was on the side of the sun, and uh, and it, we are resuming. So the, I think the first months, with for instance, if you're interested in temperature profile or surface temperature, or more difficult for us, cloud opacity, dust opacity, uh, will be available in a few months from now. Yes, please. I remember the hardest phone of um, surface is possibly a thousand kilometers. Really. What is the closest one? So the closest one? Slide oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I didn't highlight it, but it was in the transition phase. Um, so, um, so the inclination is like that? It's 25 degrees. Inclination and, oh, and, sorry, and they the, change. The, 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 it's about 20,000 kilometers. Yeah. Okay. But it's a good question. If you want, I can take this opportunity to describe a little better the, the orbit because the orbit is, is this way Mars is rotating. When you are at 20,000 kilometers, you almost, uh, uh, it's like the geo, geo uh, stationary point for a satellite. In other words, you rotate at the same. With the same rotation rate than the planets for about 12 hours you above the same area and you can if you you can monitor and make movies of the stone for instance yeah. then you move up again and when you move up you will uh, your velocity will be slower and mars will rotate below you and then you will go back down again it's about three three orbit per, per week typically you you will go back again and then stay for 12 hours ab above another region through all that time you observe all the time but uh, you, you the, the orbit was designed to have in uh, let's say nine martian days nine sols at a given location uh, the coverage of the all local time so you at every nine days you have uh, in a given area all local times and uh, all local times and at every position now 
a consequence of this choice of this orbit is what I told you. This, this the fact that you, you stay above the same regions for uh, 12 hours almost exactly. So it's interesting to make movies, for instance. Any Okay, so there are no questions. So we thank uh, Dr. Francois and also uh, for coming to us, presenting uh, the email transmission data, and hopefully, so we get the link. And we, uh, so if there are any problems, so we'll have to contact you. So you are the meeting. I'm sorry? There's an email. There's an email there. There's any problem? Yeah, if you have any um, suggestions yeah. or things that we can improve on the website as well, you can uh, give yeah. us an email. We will do because we have several people interested in, in that, and hopefully, uh, we can see if we can uh, combine efforts because we have a group here very interested, as I said. They may be watching us on, uh, on YouTube or on Zoom, and hopefully, so uh, we thank again our guests for coming. Thank you. I wish uh, good success for the MRS mass mission. So, this is as Francois said, this is good data is free. So everyone can use it. Usually, uh, on the regular space uh, mission, they, they they give us two years to be able to get hold of the data. Now it's available to everyone. That's a great contribution for the UAE in terms of uh, the Mars uh, or Anderson Mars and so on. After two billion years, you are seeing it. We're, we're taking you as a witness. Mars will be like Earth. If you want the news before, you will be like Venus. Hope you <laughs> we will see. Thank you. We will see each other. Thank you very much again for coming.